Hello, I'm Tom Kimmel. This presentation lists the reasons to support the advancement of my grandfather, Rear Admiral Husband Kimmel, on the retired list. This presentation is part one of two parts. It is a graphic representation of a paper by the same title I wrote attached to my Bureau for Correction of Naval Records, that's BCNR application in the Rear Admiral Kimmel Advancement Matter. I begin. Admiral Kimmel was the only qualified flag officer, flag officer as an admiral, not advanced to his highest held wartime rank in accordance with the Officer Personnel Act of 1947. Certainly to an honorable man, this is a form of punishment. There are a myriad of reasons why the Admiral should be so advanced. Here are some of them. The giants of World War II will be discussed in part one. It's reason one of the reasons listed here. What the giants of World War II, Nimitz, Halsey, King, Spruance, Kincaid, Burke, and a host of others have repeatedly expressed in support of Admiral Kimmel. Part two will discuss reasons two through five listed here in support of the advancement of Rear Admiral Kimmel on the retired list. <coughs> Reason one, the giants of World War II, Nimitz, Halsey, King, Spruins, Kincaid, Burke, have repeatedly expressed support for Admiral Kimmel. Consider Admiral Kimmel's successor as Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet. Admiral Chester Nimitz spoke and wrote as follows. Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox was wrong in blaming Kimmel. Admiral Kimmel had been given no information which would justify interrupting a very urgent training schedule. That second quotation comes out of the book Sea Power, which was used my senior year at the Naval Academy. 1966. I first discovered that quote on page 650. It inspired me to get seriously involved in the Admiral Kimmel matter. Admiral Halsey. Admiral Halsey, concerning Kimmel's decision to save his 36 available aircraft for future combat not to engage in token long-range reconnaissance without more threat information than was contained in the November 27th war warning message. Any admiral worth his stars would have made the same choice. So wrote Admiral Halsey in 1947. He continued, but first you should know Admiral Kimmel was not allowed to call Admiral Halsey as a witness before the Joint Congressional Committee. Notwithstanding, in the 1995, in 1995, the General Counsel of the Navy, Honigman, asserted formally in writing that Admiral Kimmel was accorded the rights of an accused before the Joint Congressional Committee and allowed to call witnesses, which, of course, was grossly in error. Admiral Halsey wrote in 1947, I'll take my oath that not one of us would have guessed that the blame would fall on Kimmel because not one of us thought he deserved it, any part of it. I want to emphasize my next statement. In all my experience, I've never known a commander-in-chief of any U.S. fleet who worked harder and under more adverse circumstances to increase its efficiency and to prepare it for war. Further, further, I know of no officer who might have been in command at that time who could have done more than Kimmel did. I also want to repeat 
and re-emphasize the answer I made when the Roberts Commission asked me how I happened to be ready for the Japanese attack. I told them because of one man, Admiral Kimmel. Fleet, also, Fleet Admiral Halsey also said, I don't believe there was a flag officer in the Pacific Fleet who did not feel that Kimmel was an ideal man for the job. Unfortunately, even an ideal man cannot do a job without the proper tools, and Kimmel did not have them. Fleet Admiral King also spoke in Kimmel's behalf. The evidence adduced against Kimmel warrants neither trial by general court-martial nor punishment in any form. Please note that all of my quotations delivered here are referenced. King continued, the Roberts Commission merely selected a scapegoat to satisfy the popular demand for fixing the responsibility for the Pearl Harbor debacle. Admiral King was not asked the important questions, nor was he given the proper chance to speak for himself. In fact, he was sold down the river as a political expedient. The commander at the Battle of Midway, Admiral Raymond Spruance, wrote to Samuel Elliott Morrison, famous World War II historian, I have always felt that Kimmel was held responsible for Pearl Harbor in order that the American people might have no reason to lose confidence in their government in Washington. This was probably justifiable under the circumstances of that time, but it does not justify forever damning this fine officer. Admiral Kincaid, the commander of the Battle of Lady Gulf by one measure, the largest battle, seagoing battle in the history of the world. Admiral Kincaid in an oral history project at Columbia University said, I always thought Kimmel was very unjustly treated. The proceedings of the Roberts Commission that went into matters out there were entirely illegal. Kimmel was made a scapegoat. That's what it was, undoubtedly nothing else. Admiral Burke. Admiral Burke was asked by Secretary of Defense Cheney in 1991 to offer his judgments in this matter. Admiral Burke wrote to Secretary of Defense Cheney, it is my judgment, Secretary of Defense Cheney, that you should approve this posthumous promotion and recommend it to the President, not because of the importance to the Kimmel family, but because of the importance to the Navy as an institution. He continued, I have always been of the firm opinion that those who decide not to furnish important information should bear the responsibility for that decision. Admiral Kimmel's predecessor as Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet had much to say, but he held his fire until 1973 he did that because he was highly critical of his very good friend, Admiral Stark, and he ensured that his book would not be published until Admiral Stark deceased. Admiral Stark deceased in 1972. Admiral Richardson, I consider the Chief of Naval Operations Stark in failing to pick up the telephone and give Kimmel a last-minute alert on the morning of Pearl Harbor committed a major professional lapse indicating a basic absence of those personal military characteristics required in a successful war leader. I cannot conceive of how he could have treated Kimmel as he did unless his failure to obey his natural impulse was due to direct orders from above. Admiral Richardson continued, the subordinates in a military organization cannot stand with their arms raised in protective alertness forever. Some superior has to ring a bell that moves the subordinate to the center of the ring. That bell was never rung by Kimmel's superiors in Washington. He continued, I consider that after Pearl Harbor, Admiral Kimmel received the rawest of raw deals from Franklin Roosevelt, and insofar as they acquiesced in this treatment, 
from Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox and Chief of Naval Operations Betty Stark. Admiral Richardson, I cannot conceive of any honorable man being able to recall his service as a member of the Roberts Commission without great regret and the deepest feeling of shame. This procedure should have outraged every American. I believe that the report of the Roberts Commission was the most unfair, unjust, and deceptively dishonest document ever printed by the government printing office. Speaking of the Roberts Commission, Commission member, former Chief of Naval Operations, Stanley, William Stanley, later repudiated the findings of the Roberts Commission. He wrote, Later, I knew from first-hand experience the shortcomings of our base at Pearl Harbor, for which Short and Kimmel were in no way responsible. He told historian John Tolan that Chairman Owen Roberts' performance as chairman of the Roberts Commission was crooked as a snake. He continued, I can't help regretting that Admiral Kimmel had to go. I have never seen the fleet in a higher state of efficiency than was evidenced during the course of our investigations at Pearl Harbor. I felt quite sure that nothing would be done to correct any inequities in punishment already administered or withheld. Historian Samuel Elliott Morrison who wrote the official history of naval operations in World War II at the urging of Presidents Roosevelt and President Truman, changed his opinion in his 1948 negative opinion of Kimmel and wrote in 1961 that Admiral Kimmel was no more blamable than a host of people in Washington. Turner and Garreau, Marshall, Miles, and Wilkinson. If I were pushed to name one person as being more careless or stupid than all the rest, it would be Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner. If you and your friends are getting up any sort of petition to have Admiral Kimmel's status restored or record changed, you can count on me to sign it. So wrote Samuel Elliott Morrison to the then head of the Naval Academy Alumni Association, Admiral Shafroth, in 1961. Roberto Wallstetter is largely responsible for changing my views and ought to be thanked. Former commander of the Asiatic Fleet, Admiral Harry Yarnell, Yarnell had much to say about the matter. The most disgraceful feature of the whole affair was the evident determination on the part of Washington to fasten the blame on the Hawaiian commanders. He continued, Admiral Stark and General Marshall could have raised their reputations greatly by candidly, and candidly admitting that their failures to send vital information to Pearl Harbor was the cause of the disaster. Yet they tried to defend themselves by failures of memory and the absurd stand that Short and Kimmel had all the information that was necessary. History will record them both as weak and incompetent yes-men, tools of a president ignorant of the character of the enemy with whom he was dealing, yet through his egotism and his conviction that he was a great statesman and strategist, blundered into war with his armed forces unprepared. Admiral Yarnell. One of the strongest impressions of the affair is the lack of moral courage on anyone in Washington from the president down to accept in the slightest degree any blame for the tragedy in the face of overwhelming evidence that their incompetence and stupidity was entirely responsible for what happened. The British had almost as great a disaster on their hands through the sinking of the Repulse and the Prince of Wales a few days later a few days after the Pearl Harbor attack, in the face of strong demands for an investigation. Mr. Churchill said that if anyone was to blame, he was, and that there would be no investigation until the war was over. What a pity that Mr. Roosevelt did not have the guts to accept the same procedure, especially in view of the fact 
that he was mainly responsible. The commander of Navy Patrol Wing at Pearl Harbor, the Navy Patrol Wing at Pearl Harbor, Admiral Bellinger, testified to the Hart Inquiry. Considering shortages and deficiencies, other necessary deployment of forces, such as expansion training and development of facilities, and lacking unity of command, little, if any more, in the way of readiness could be expected. It is believed that Admiral Kimmel saw this picture very realistically, and I know of no man who, under the circumstances, could have done more. Admiral Bellinger then unloaded to uh, Palo Coletta in 1987 when he said the Pearl Harbor attack was a deep dyed deliberate plan to get this country into war with Japan and Germany by needling the Japanese into making the first war move. FDR and his cohorts criminally failed to keep Admiral Kimmel informed of information that was available. Information that the simplest mind would have known was of vital importance to the protection of the fleet. Former Director of Naval Intelligence, Captain Pulliston, said, Admiral Kimmel was unjust, unjustly sacrificed with General Short to shield the shortcomings of the President and High Command in Washington who, as Secretary of War Stimson has revealed, sought to entice Japan into striking the first blow. Major General Glenn Egerton of the United States Army, governor of the Panama Canal Zone when Pearl Harbor was attacked. I read those dispatches the same way you did, Admiral Leary, as warnings against sabotage. I know that Alaska and the Philippines did the same. We all put our planes in tight circles and had them patrolled by centuries. General Andrew Goodpasture, former NATO commander and former superintendent of West Point, offered this. With nothing less than our country's honor still at stake, May we hope finally to restore Admiral Kimmel and General Short the respect they deserve. Captain Ned Beach, the famous submarine commander and author of Scapegoats, put it succinctly, our country must not continue to perpetuate a lie. Navy Cross winner, Captain Joe Tossig, Jr., Navy Cross winner at Pearl Harbor, had this to say about Pearl Harbor radar. I do not think it's strange that the so-called radar warning was ignored, for as Sir Winston might have put it, it had much to be ignored about. On 7 December 1941, this experimental equipment was extremely unreliable, mostly because it was, so to speak, false return prone. A flight of gulls, for example, could snap through the entire system. And anyone purporting to see a flight of bombers on an A-scope circa December 1941 was indeed a seer of great perception. One aircraft made the same mess of the scope as a hundred and any number of boats, ships, and seagulls could do the same. Captain Tossig on Pearl Harbor guns. In sum and substance, the fleet actually lacked an anti-aircraft protection worthy of the name. It is, in fact, remarkable that any Japanese aircraft were actually shot down by these batteries. This was not the fault of the crews. They were drilled incessantly and performed perfectly. It was purely a matter of equipment. The weaponry intended to defend against air attacks was incapable of meeting the threat posed by the Japanese. Major General Henry Russell, member of the Army Pearl Harbor Board, 
writing in 1946, but not to be published until 2001, when his heirs found his manuscript. General Henry Russell. I believe then and believe now that all those responsible for our defeat at Pearl Harbor should have been dealt with alike. If one was driven out of the service, all should have been. If one was forgiven, all should have been. To select an individual as a sacrifice for the sins of the group was not only unfair, but was downright despicable. To me, the conduct of those in high places after the attack was dishonest and inexcusable. He continued, concerning the Army Pearl Harbor Board, there was nothing difficult about reaching conclusions. They were perfectly obvious, so much so, as a matter of fact, that they shouted at the investigators. The conduct of the War Department from the evening of December 6, 1941, until the time of the attack reflects a state of inefficiency, which is so amazing that its description would not be believed were it not so completely established. And talking, speaking of the Army Pearl Harbor Board, this from their top, top secret report in 1944, where information has a vital bearing upon actions to be taken by field commanders, and this information cannot be disclosed to the field commanders, it is incumbent upon the War Department then to assume the responsibility for specific direction to the theater commanders. This is an exception to the admirable policy of complete responsibility upon the field commanders. General Short and Admiral Kimmel got neither form of assistance from the War Department. The War Department had the information, all they had to do was either to give it to Short or Kimmel or give them directions based upon it. General MacArthur's head of intelligence, General Charles Willoughby, wrote, to quote from a staff report of the period, it was known that the Japanese consul in Honolulu cabled, cabled Tokyo reports on general ship movements. In October, his instructions were sharpened. Tokyo called for specific instead of general reports. In November, the daily reports were on a grid system of the inner harbor with coordinate locations of American men of war. This was no longer a case of diplomatic curiosity. Coordinate grid is the classical method for pinpoint target designation. Our battleships had suddenly become targets. More from General Willoughby, this time on magic, the secret decoding of Japanese diplomatic and spy communications prior to the Pearl Harbor attack, which gave indications of the time, place, reason, and the sea plan to cover the Pearl Harbor attack. General Willoughby, the sequence of messages, messages referred to had they been known to a competent intelligence officer with battle order and tactical background beginning with November 14th would have led instantly to the inescapable conclusion that Pearl Harbor naval installations were a target for attack with November 25th or November 29th as the deadline suggesting irresistibly that a lapsed time was involved for some sort of naval seaborne sortie. Admiral Robert Theobald, author of The Final Secret of Pearl Harbor, wrote in 1954, after studying the bomb plot message, no military intelligence organization could fail to reach that deduction that it was to prepare the detailed plan for a surprise attack on the major units of the fleet moored there. Admiral William Friedman, Admiral William Friedman, William Friedman of the Army Security Agency, the man who broke purple, purple was the uh, code, 
one of the magic codes was designated purple. William Friedman wrote on the certain aspects of magic in the cryptological background of the various official investigations in the attack on Pearl Harbor. He wrote in 1957 that after studying Tokyo's dispatch number 83, that would be the bomb plot message, no military intelligence organization can fail to reach the deduction that it was to prepare the detailed plan for a surprise attack on the major units of the fleet moored there. Here, I think, is the kernel of the nut, the secret of why the U.S. was taken by surprise. I have underlined the phrase, no military intelligence organization, in the foregoing extract from Admiral Theobald's book on page 46, because I think that our military and naval intelligence organizations had serious defects at that time, and I think they still do. Mr. Friedman continued, Senators Ferguson and Brewster in their minority report, that's the congressional report, minority report, say even if the win execute message they saw was a false one, they believed it true at the time and should have acted accordingly. A good point, and I think one that should be emphasized. It is too bad it wasn't followed up regardless of any other consideration. I think that serious defects in our military and naval intelligence made it possible for the Japanese to take us by surprise at Pearl Harbor. A strong statement? Yes, but I think it is warranted. I think that Kimmel and Short were not as culpable as I first thought they were in 1941 and 42. The Washington authorities were culpable too, maybe a lot more culpable than were these two officers. I think that Kimmel and Short should have been sent more information, even if they were sent only gists of magic, to let them evaluate for themselves the significance of what the Japanese were saying. General Miles, the head of Army Intelligence, says that the warning message sent them were of far more importance than anything they could have got from magic. I don't agree. Today, in 1957, I think they, the minority of the Joint Congressional Committee, hit closer to the truth than did the majority. I think Mr. Keith's additional views on the majority report made good sense. Kimmel and Short, he said, were not the sole culprits. I think that the intelligence services came off rather easily, too easily, in the fixing of responsibility and pointing out derelictions. I think that Admiral Stark was wrong in waiting for General Marshall to be found before sending off a message to Kimmel and Short and to the overseas commanders as soon as the last part of the 14-part Tokyo to Washington message became available, especially when he knew from magic that Ambassadors Karushu and Nomura were told exactly to the minute when to present the whole message to Secretary of State Cordell Hall. In 1957, exactly May 8, 1957, William Friedman wrote, Today, General Sanford, the head of the National Security Agent, phoned me, Agency phoned me to say that he did not think it advisable to publish my brochure at all. I accepted his decision without question. Friedman's brochure was not declassified by NSA until 2013 and wasn't released to the public until 2015. Admiral Kimmel and General Short had no idea that William Friedman had written such a brochure. Colonel Alfred McCormick, a lawyer that the Secretary of War Stinson designated in 1942 to come in and solve the obvious problems of magic distribution 
that were all too apparent. Colonel McCormick wrote to his boss, Carter Clark, in 1943, and said that when the sudden attack on Pearl Harbor occurred, it became apparent that the event had been clearly foreshadowed in the Japanese traffic of 1941. Of course, this was not declassified until 1981. Admiral Kimmel had no idea that it existed. Former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, former Chief of Naval Operation and Pearl Harbor Survival, Admiral Thomas Moore wrote to his colleague, Vice Admiral David Richardson, former Deputy Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet. He wrote to him in 1991, in which he said, if Nelson and Napoleon had been at Pearl Harbor, it would have made no difference. Pictured here is Admiral Moore testifying in Admiral Kimball's behalf at the Thurman hearing in the Senate office building in 1995. President Roosevelt's aide, naval aide, Admiral John McCrae, said, if an officer who is a combination of Lord Nelson, Commodore Barry, and John Paul Jones had been commander-in-chief of the Pacific, the result at Pearl Harbor would not have changed one bit. Admiral Smedberg, aide, one of seven aides, naval aides, to Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Stark wrote of Admiral Kimmel, I'd been in Kimmel's destroyer squadron, and there was never a man in the Navy who worked harder to prepare a Navy for a war than Kimmel. He put us through things that no other squadron commander had ever done, and it kept us on our toes. Kimmel was a man who really, I think, would have been a great wartime commander, and had already done a great deal to get his fleet ready with what he had. He was just caught in a vice. He was the fall guy on the scene. It was just criminal, because all his life, he had done more than his contemporaries to get the fleet ready. Every unit he'd ever had. Smedberg continued. In the minds of the general public, he was caught with his pants down, but he wasn't. The very fact that the fleet reacted as it did and was able to get the ammunition to the guns and start shooting as they did with the Sunday crews on board was evidence of the fact that he had kept training to be prepared for anything up. He just is a fall guy in history, but he was a magnificent officer. General Albert Wittemeyer, author of the Wittemeyer Reports, wrote, My confidence in General Marshall's integrity, his loyalty to principles and friends, had been shaken, but not, by, but not destroyed by the testimony he gave before the Army Board investigating Pearl Harbor. No doubt, I had been naive. He continued, although not too much has been made of our code-breaking activities, we knew enough about Japanese intentions in November 1941 to have forestalled any attack upon us anywhere. Rear Admiral Max Showers, I'll let him speak for himself. Head of Admiral Husband Kimmel, then in charge of the Pacific Fleet. I am one of the school who thinks that Admiral Kimmel has been made a scapegoat. <laughs> Director of Naval History, Admiral Sam Cox, gave a Pearl Harbor Day message. It was delivered to every admiral in the United States Navy last Pearl Harbor Day, which was December 7th. 2016. In pertinent part, it said, an unstated reason for denying Kimmel a requested court-martial 
is that a trial would have risked the reputations of many senior military and government officials in Washington, D.C., who were far more culpable of the failures that led to surprise at Pearl Harbor than Kimmel was. I'll end part one with this message from the former Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden. The Kimmel in short matter is the most tragic injustice in military history. Ladies and gentlemen, this ends part one of my presentation on the reasons to support Admiral Kimmel for advancement posthumously on the retired list. Thank you very much for your kind attention.